There was a brief, if frosty, handshake today between the Russian leader, Vladimir Putin, and Ukraine's President Poroshenko. Even as they sat down to talk peace in Minsk, the fighting continued in eastern Ukraine. The United States is threatening to arm government forces. The Russians are already arming the separatists. This conflict has pushed the world to the brink of a new Cold War. At its heart lies one event. On the 20th of February last year, when a massacre of protesters on Kiev's independence square known as Maidan led to the overthrow of Ukraine's government, Gabriel Gatehouse, who was there that day, has been back to Kiev and has new revelations about what really happened. His report contains distressing images and strong language. Night has fallen. Maidan is divided. Police control one side of the square protesters the other. This has been going on for months now. But away from the burning barricades, in the dark corners of the protest camp, some are preparing for a fight. I understood that this could be the end of everything. I knew that by going in there, I might never come back. More than 50 people were killed that day. The massacre would bring down Ukraine's pro-Moscow president, prompting Russia to annex Crimea and sparking a separatist movement in the east. Most of the dead were protesters, gunned down by riot police who were retreating from the square. But not all. I kept getting calls from the police officer who said, I have three people wounded, five people wounded, I have one person dead. And at some point, he says, I'm pulling out. The question of what really happened that day goes to the heart of a confrontation that has led to the most dangerous standoff between Russia and the West since the end of the Cold War. The protest leaders, many of whom now hold positions of power in the new Ukraine, have always maintained that full responsibility for the shootings lies with the security forces acting on behalf of the previous government. Our investigations suggest that is not the full picture. Only three people have been arrested over the killings, all of them members of this police unit, seen here firing towards the protesters. But that was after nine o'clock in the morning, as the police retreated from the square. What happened before that? What prompted them to pull back? Earlier that morning, Andrei Shevchenko, then an opposition politician and part of the protest movement known as Maidan, had received a call from the police commander on the square. He calls me and he says, Andre, someone is shooting at my guys. And he said that uh, the shooting was from the conservatory. He said, second floor, it's, fire, uh, it's firearms. And uh, please do something about that, because it's getting really bad. Amid the chaos, Mr. Shevchenko contacted the man in charge of security at the protest camp. He remembers the shots coming from somewhere different. The location matters. The Hotel Ukraine was, that morning, largely under the control of government forces. But the conservatory building, several hundred metres away, was firmly in the hands of the protesters. Just after 8 o'clock that morning, a news photographer had managed to get into the building with his camera. When I come inside, uh, I was saw the guys. Uh, one come after me. Oh, this is just a hunter gun. Hunting rifle. H hunting rifle. And uh, I, I saw the guy with the Kalashnikov. And uh, after that, uh, I come outside 
and uh, saw the other guys who was also with guns. Some of them lying on the floor, some of them uh, hiding after, uh, behind the columns on the second floor. And uh, uh, after that, uh, the guys who saw me and said, go out, go out. On the morning of the 20th, there were persistent reports of gunfire coming from the conservatory building. Now, for the first time, one of those gunmen has spoken on camera. He was part of the protest movement, he said, and agreed to talk to us on condition that we disguise his identity. We will call him Sergei. It was the Maidan security people who gathered us and asked, if it comes to it, who here can shoot? And I said, I can shoot. So they said, OK, if there's no other way out, then you will do this work. That was on the 19th. Earlier that day, Sergei had been told to meet a man on the edge of the protest camp who appeared carrying a box. He had brought a 12 caliber shotgun, lots of ammunition and a saiga. That's a rifle that fires high velocity rounds similar to a standard Kalashnikov. I took that weapon off him. It had a sight attached. I know how to use this gun because I served in the army. Early in the morning of the 20th, as the first shots rang out, Sergei was escorted into the conservatory building and up onto the second floor balcony. Sergei says that he took up a position behind one of these pillars here and he mentions being able to see that clock over there on the far side of the square on the bank and the edge of the shopping centre, which was the part of the square that was controlled by the riot police. So from here, he had a bird's eye view right over the front line. I was shooting downwards at their feet. Of course, I could have hit them in the arm or anywhere, but I didn't shoot to kill. I also shot upward at the police who were on the top of the Globus shopping center, and that is why they retreated. The Maidan commander told us he sent his men to search the conservatory building as soon as he got the phone call. But Sergei tells a different story. He says he and another gunman were shooting for about 20 minutes when some men came and dragged them away. I was just reloading. They ran up to me and one put his foot on top of me and said, they want a word with you, everything is okay, but stop doing what you're doing. Sergei says he was driven to the outskirts of the city and left to make his own way home. By that time, three policemen were dead and the massacre of protesters had begun. <laughs> By evening, Maidan has shifted from battle mode into mourning. Dazed and exhausted, the protesters are beginning to absorb the scale of their loss. Some have seen their comrades gunned down in front of their eyes by security forces, but others were killed in more mysterious circumstances and it isn't over yet. As the sun sets, a group of men and women are clearing up. Everything seems calm, and suddenly, a single shot rings out. A man lies fatally wounded on the ground. The man's name was Vladimir Melnychuk. He was unarmed, talking to his mother on the phone, his wife was standing next to him. Earlier that morning, we too had seen someone firing out of the upper floors of the Hotel Ukraine. Uh, what is that? Huh? That, that window yeah. facing directly to us. Yeah. Fuck! OK, get the fuck out of here. That is coming straight out of that window. Which one? Up there, okay. Yeah, our hotel. That window. Which one? 
Um, okay, one, two, three, four, fifth row from the left, second from the top, one that was open. By this point, the hotel lobby was being used as a makeshift hospital. It was chaos. No one controlled access. Anyone could have got in. Later that night, Andri Parubi's Maidan security men were roaming the upper floors of the hotel, knocking on doors, including our own, looking for a sniper. Нашли места, откуда мог стрелять снайпер, где были патроны, где был видно, что что это возможно была огневая точка, но самого снайпера. There's no question that government security forces did have snipers positioned on tall buildings overlooking Maidan and the surrounding area. But their intercepted radio communications suggest confusion at the very least, or possibly that they were not alone. It's unclear exactly where Mr Melnychuk was shot from. But the official investigation has focused on the shots fired by the riot police roughly seven hours earlier. More than a dozen other deaths are similarly unexplained, and those who've tried to widen their inquiries have found their efforts thwarted. I've spoken to a senior investigator at the General Prosecutor's Office here, who's convinced that whoever was firing from the Hotel Ukraine was targeting both sides. He's gathering evidence that he says will prove that the massacre on Maidan on the 20th of February was the culmination of a carefully worked out plot, the aim of which was to cause maximum chaos. But, he says, his investigations are constantly being blocked by the courts. In the absence of a thorough and transparent investigation, conspiracy theories flourish. Many Ukrainians believe the shootings on the 20th were a provocation planned and orchestrated by Moscow in order to justify the annexation of Crimea. Эта стрельба 20 числа была произведена снайперами, которые прибыли с России и которые руководились центром российского. И тот факт, что стрельба велась и по самообороне Майдана, и по Беркуту, она дает мне право считать, что те, кто стрелял, их не цель была, чтобы была стычка кровавая и чтобы залить Майдан кровью. Russians counter that Maidan was a CIA-inspired coup. Neither side offers credible evidence for its claims. It is now clear that some of the shooting was coming from the protesters' side. But let there be no doubt. Maidan was overwhelmingly made up of peaceful, unarmed citizens who braved months of sub-zero temperatures to demand a change to their corrupt government. From the very first day of Maidan, we told our people never ever use force. We knew that uh, our strength was not to use force. And uh, our weakness would be if we start uh, shooting. The leaders of Maidan say they did their best to ensure that weapons were kept away from the square. But Sergei suggests otherwise. He says his gun was part of a stash of weapons kept overnight at the central post office, a building under the protesters' control. Контролировать каждый момент было очень тяжело. И, конечно, сказать, что в ту ночь, вот был, что я полностью знал, что в помещении размещено, это было бы неправдой, потому что это действительно Sergei, who'd been demonstrating on Maidan for more than a month, claims he was recruited as a potential shooter back in January. He would not identify the recruiter, saying only that he was a retired military officer. I went out for a smoke one night. There were other people smoking too. We got talking. He saw something in me that he liked. Officers are like psychologists. They can see who is capable. Please, don't shout. The two stayed in touch when Sergei wanted to join one of the more militant groups on Maidan. 
The ex-officer told him to hold off. Your time will come, he said. He kept me under his wing. I knew very well this wasn't going to end with clubs and Molotov cocktails. I asked him whether he got the feeling that the officer was grooming him. Yes, psychologically. Not that we sat down and worked out a plan, but we talked about it privately and he prepared me for it. There is much we still do not know. We don't know who fired the first shots that day. We don't know who was firing from the Hotel Ukraine. As for the conspiracy theories, it's possible that Sergei was manipulated, played like a pawn in a much bigger game. But that's not the way he sees it. He was a simple protester, he says, who took up arms in self-defence. I didn't want to shoot anyone or kill anyone, but that was the situation. I tell you, I don't feel like some kind of hero. The opposite. I have trouble sleeping, bad premonitions. I'm trying to control myself, but I just get nervous all the time. I have nothing to be proud of. It's easy to shoot, living afterwards, that's the hard thing. But you have to defend your country. Gabriel Gatehouse reporting there from Ukraine.